Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to our uh, second annual conference here at the Baker Institute, uh, uh, co-sponsored by uh, Baker Bots. Um, we are very proud to uh, be able to host this event. Uh, last year's was phenomenal. I'm sure this year's will um, uh, do nothing to disappoint. Um, it should be fantastic, particularly given the lineup of speakers we have and having the, the issues that we'll be discussing. Um, I just want to make a couple of housekeeping announcements. Um, first, uh, there are no planned fire drills for today. Um, so if you hear an alarm go off, uh, please exit the building either through the back this way or out the front. There are a couple of muster points uh, on either side of the building. Uh, hopefully that won't be an issue. Uh, also, um, uh, the restrooms uh, in this building, some people always walk around trying to figure out where they are. The women's restroom is behind me on this side. The men's is, is on the other side uh, of the building. Um, follow along in the program. Uh, we will have a couple of coffee breaks, which are great for networking and sort of catching your breath. Uh, there's a lot of material that we'll be going through today and covering. Uh, should be phenomenal. Uh, we'll begin uh, with a, a discussion of, of technology and its role uh, in revolutions in energy, which is the subject of this conference. Uh, and we'll move on from there into a discussion on the future of electricity. Uh, we'll have an energy outlook presented, uh, move into the, the, the future of global natural gas markets and how they're evolving. Um, we'll hear from uh, Secretary Baker uh, after lunch uh, on carbon dividends, uh, which of course uh, you all know he uh, was instrumental in drafting a plan uh, related to carbon tax and, and rebate, um, uh, which has garnered increasing attention over the last, uh, uh, last year. So uh, that's, that's very interesting. It'd be great to hear from him on that. Uh, and then we'll have a discussion on the Permian and the challenges we actually see there. It's probably one of the hottest areas uh, in the oil and gas space, uh, and it's very close to home uh, here in Texas. Um, and then we'll move into a discussion on energy finance, finance before wrapping up. So we'll be discussing things all over the energy map. Uh, and the speakers that we have today are, again, just phenomenal. So this should be a, a really, really good day. Uh, hopefully you take good notes and walk away with uh, more information than you had when you came in. Um, with that, I'm going to step aside and hand it over to Stephen Miles, who has been my partner in crime in developing this, uh, this agenda. Uh, and again, I want to thank uh, wholeheartedly uh, Baker Bots for uh, their sponsorship and participation in putting this together. Stephen. Well, one cannot have a better partner institutionally than the Baker Institute and personally than Ken Medlock. Uh, Ken and uh, his colleagues and the ambassador have just been tremendously supportive of our goals of trying to foster a dialogue between companies and clients of ours in the energy space and uh, leading thought leaders, uh, whether they be in, uh, in academia or government, um, law or in business. Uh, good morning. My name is Steve Miles. We're really excited about this program. I won't walk us through it because I think Ken just did a fantastic job on that, with that. Um, I'll just say a couple things. We, uh, I have the, the joy and privilege of leading something called the Energy Sector Committee at Baker Botts. And, and what that is is uh, actually a brainchild of Andy Bakers, our managing partner, to try to break down walls of disciplines or the way lawyers think about practices and trying to shoehorn your problem into their idea of what the practice is. Instead, break down disciplines, break down geographies, and think holistically about solutions to complex problems for our energy clients. So we, uh, we take this very seriously. It's an important part of what we do. It's, it's why we sponsored the World Gas Conference, which was in Washington, D.C., uh, first time in the U.S. for 30 years, in 30 years this summer. We were the only law firm to do that because we really wanted to help support and foster um, you know, intellectual discussion and debate around leading energy issues. We have... Um, um, uh, so we're very excited to be uh, here with you all today as well. Um, it's my pleasure, and I have to pick up one page, excuse me, thank you. It's my pleasure uh, to introduce um, our, our next speaker, Ambassador Duration. And the ambassador is um, director here of Rice University's Baker Institute. His career in the U.S. Foreign Service uh, was just spectacular, impressive, and spanned eight presidents' uh, administrations from John F. Kennedy to William J. Clinton. Ambassador Drazian is really one of our nation's foremost leading experts on national security, 
foreign policy and the complex political, security, economic, religious, ethnic issues, I can't even imagine all this together, particularly in the Middle East and South Asia. He's played key roles in the Arab-Israeli peace process and in regional conflict resolution, and he's an acclaimed author, having uh, authored Danger and Opportunity, an American ambassador's journey through the Middle East. He holds degrees from uh, Georgetown and from Middlebury College. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Ambassador Duration. Thank you, Steve. A very generous introduction. All it proves in a CV like that is you just have to live long enough. There's a, uh, a joke in the Middle East that I'm so old I can remember the Dead Sea when it was only sick. <laughs> so uh, it's really my great pleasure to welcome you to uh, Rice University's uh, <clears throat> Baker Institute for Public Policy, which proves what I think a promised for a day of timely and relevant discussions on energy issues, as Ken Medlock has, has indicated. And this is indeed our second uh, annual uh, Baker Botts Energy Conference. We hope to carry on the legacy of last year's uh, conference by delivering unparalleled analysis on how the energy landscape uh, in our world is changing today, and as you know, it's changing dynamically along with how these changes will affect our collective uh, future. Uh, this year marks the 25th anniversary of Rice University's Baker Institute. We're celebrating throughout the year with commemorative events, uh, of which this conference is a highlight, uh, a highlight of uh, one of our most important public policy research programs. Next month, we will have our 25th anniversary gala featuring as our guest of honor, President Barack Obama, who will sit down with our honorary chair, Secretary Baker, for a discussion. It really symbolizes reaching across the aisles at a time when our body politic is so partisan and even tribal. And that conversation is going to be moderated by John Meacham, a very noted presidential historian. So it's going to be an exceptional event. What's important for us at the Baker Institute on this is since we opened our doors, we will have had, with Barack Obama, every living former president of the United States hosted at the Baker Institute. So that's a legacy and a tradition that we are very, uh, very proud of. Um, through these years, we've remained true to our original model of a nonpartisan think tank, building our research programs on the principle of comparative advantage. Obviously, the first program I initiated here years back was the energy program, used in the energy capital of the world. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure that one out. And it has been very, very successful. Uh, the Center for Energy Studies, led by Ken Medlock and his team of exceptional fellows, is a prime example of our, our model, uh, which draws on Houston, again, as I said, the energy capital of the world. The center was ranked in 2017 as the top energy public policy institute in the world a distinction for which we are immensely proud. The Baker Institute itself has been ranked as the third top university-affiliated think tank in the world, preceded by the London School of Economics and Harvard's Belfer Center, not bad company to be in. So we're very proud to partner with Baker Botts uh, for this event. Our ties with Baker Botts are very close uh, through both our honorary chair, Secretary Baker, and his grandfather, Captain Baker, who was instrumental in founding this great university. And I think he had something to do, Andy, with your law firm. <laughs> Baker Botts is one of the world's premier energy law firms and is very well placed to speak to global developments in the energy industry. So on this note, I'm happy to introduce Andy Baker, the managing partner of Baker Botts. You know, we, we, we're sort of data-driven in our research at the Baker Institute, so we did our data research on Andy Baker and the DNA proves that there is absolutely no gene genealogical connection between Andy and the Baker family. <laughs> no nepotism. Andy joined Baker Botts Houston office in 1979, and in 1985 helped to open the firm's Dallas office. He has served as managing partner since 2012, and last year was reappointed for another term in that role. Under his uh, dynamic leadership, but Baker Botts has continued to advance as one of the world's leading corporate law firms. So please join me in welcoming Andy Baker to our podium.
Thank you, Ambassador, and uh, welcome uh, fellow partner Steve Miles, Ken Medlock, and distinguished speakers, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm glad your report didn't come out before my election six or seven years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Name confusion and a few hanging chads is why I'm standing here before you. Um, I feel like I am in Washington. There is a lot of introductions. I'll make this really quick. Uh, we're really pleased, Baker Botts is, to welcome you to this, to this summit. I think it's fair to say that in the past five years, the energy industry has experienced change, maybe as in no other period before it, but this industry's ability to adapt is testament to its resilience and to its innovation. And it is this ability of this industry to do that, uh, to anticipate change, to leverage change, to better position it, is why conferences like this are so important because it contributes to this analysis so mightily. Energy companies are not just energy companies anymore. They're technology companies. And they must innovate, invent, transform, create new structures to remain uh, true to their purpose and to their, to their opportunities. And as an international law firm uh, with deep ties and history in this industry, uh, we've been privileged to work with so many of you in helping th think through and implement those changes. We've represented energy companies in over 120 countries. Our clients and our scope of experience covers the leading domestic and international oil and gas operators, electricity providers, service companies, pipelines, in addition to numerous regional and independent producers, processors, transporters, distributors, and marketers. Our group's size and reputation and experience base has earned us a reputation as an energy powerhouse and has led to us receiving the highest honors for energy practices from Chambers, Legal 500, US News and World Report, and others. And we've had the privilege just recently to work on some of the largest and most transformative energy deals, the recent $10.8 billion BHP BP America deal, one of, if not the largest energy deal in the US this year, is a perfect example of the kind of thing we engage in. We represented Vectron in their merger with Centerpoint, creating an energy delivery infrastructure and services company with massive scale. We represented AES just recently in its joint venture with Siemens, which combined AES's market-leading battery-based energy storage business with the worldwide distribution capabilities of Siemens. And projects like this require true collaboration, and collaboration is in our DNA. And that is why we are so pleased to be collaborating and working with the Baker Institute. The Baker Institute is the perfect partner and the Center for Energy Studies here is recognized around the world for its leadership, its insight, and its expertise in this vitally important field. And among its mandates is to explore and provide insights into the policies economics and regulatory environments and their respective impact on the evolution of the global energy sector. So once again, welcome. We, um, we appreciate uh, your being here. I know that uh, you'll have an exciting opportunity. Our first keynote speaker, John Gibson, I know is going to talk about all of these things. Uh, as mentioned earlier, later this day, Secretary Baker will join and share in his thoughts on the landscape and uh, what impact it will have on the energy sector. So thanks for coming. Enjoy the summit. Excellent, uh, excellent beginning. So we're going to jump right in. Um, I'm going to introduce John Gibson, but before I do that, he has agreed to take some questions near the end of his uh, uh, opening remarks and generally throughout the day when you're going to ask a question you'll see there are mics in the aisles 
uh, please come up, introduce yourself, and keep your question brief. Um, uh, too often, people will stand up and, and make a five-minute speech before they actually get to the question, and uh, John's promised me he has some humor to throw at you if that actually happens, but uh, please, please keep your questions brief so we can actually hear from the speakers and their thoughts on this. So with that, I'm going to yield the floor to John Gibson. John is the uh, chairman of the Energy Technology uh, a group at uh, Tudor Pickering Holt. He also has uh, a couple of director appointments on some technology-oriented companies, uh, uh, also some appointments on energy advisory boards at, at University of Southern California, at University of Texas, at U of H. Um, so he's very well within his realm of expertise. Uh, adding to that, he has some experience uh, uh, in the oil and gas industry as well. So he brings a breadth of knowledge and experience to uh, this discussion. Uh, and I always like to say, I mean, anytime I get a chance to hear from somebody who has a geology background, you know you're going to be entertained. Uh, inevitably, in, in every situation where I've been in an interdisciplinary sort of setting, uh, it's always the geologists that make the best jokes. So uh, I'm sure we'll, we'll hear some of that uh, uh, from John. With that, John. You know, there's, there's, the difficulty is not being nervous when speaking to a crowd like this, uh, because I know everyone here is probably an expert on the topics I'll talk about, and I'm just going to try to give you some color around some things I enjoy. I will tell you that, uh, you know, the thing that I love about it, I'm going to really focus mostly on technology and uh, assuming we'll have much better people on policy. Uh, but in, in looking at technology, I started my career as a geologist, and I managed research for Chevron Corporation for the subsurface out in La Habra when we had Chevron Oilfield Research Company. Most exciting time of, of my life was doing research because you got to be with people that were incredibly bright and uh, excited about the future and felt like they could make a difference. I uh, went through my career, and I won't go through my resume, but so I get to the end of my career, I'm a geologist, and I become a banker. And so I had to go and take the 79 series test on banking to be an investment banker, and, and I'm 60 plus years old, and I'm in a room full of 25 year olds taking the test, and I'm chairman of the audit committee for a public company and on another audit committee. And it dawned on me about halfway through the test that if I fail that test, it might be a reportable event. So. <laughs> <laughs> you, you don't realize how much pressure you can create for yourself by, by sitting there. But fortunately, uh, I was, was able to get through that. Um, make sure I look down here. Uh, 30 minutes is uh, about how long my wife would tell you it takes to introduce myself. So um, I, I really tried to take a look at this and put it into sort of three themes that, that I felt like are really important when we look at technology. And, and at, at Tudor Pickering Holt, Maynard Holt uh, and I ran into one another one day and we were talking and, and he said, John, you think about this all the time. Would you come and think about this for Tudor Pickering Holt? And what I was thinking about was the role that technology was playing in life, the role it was playing in energy, the role it was playing in politics. And, and so and he, we started talking, we go, this, this is going to change energy in so many ways. And it's not restricted to oil and gas. And so as I go through this, you're gonna find that I'm, I'm just making statements so that you think about it. I'm, not, I'm neither pedantic nor am I uh, unprepared to change in the face of better facts. And so I'm looking for better facts and, uh, and, and we'll move accordingly. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna say that the three things that we wanna talk about, is I'm gonna talk about people, I talk about power, and then I'll talk about the planet. And I'm gonna say those three things, I think are where the revolution in energy is going to occur over the next few decades. And, uh, and for those of you in suits, I do own a dark suit and plan on being buried in it. Um, the, <laughs> so, uh, with humans, okay, I'm going to read through a few characteristics of humans, and then as, as I, I listen to them, I mean, you can obviously disagree with me, but just think of the worst person you know and then apply these traits to that person, and then we'll, we'll jump over the other side. I, when working in the industry, I find that uh, humans tend to be unreliable. They're inconsistent. They're hard to train. They attrit. They're unpredictable. They're difficult to improve. Uh, data capture from them is often extremely hard. They fatigue quickly. They're injury prone. They're litigious. They're high maintenance. They're costly to relocate. They require supervision and demand wages. Okay. 
That's pretty much every employee I've ever had work for me in my career. Okay. Now, as a consequence, if you go down through that list, we look at things that uh, we, we measure in our industry, like lost time incident rate. Um, we look at benefits. We look at overtime. We look at fatigue issues when we're in, in, in Midland, for instance, and we're working these guys as much as we can. Uh, we look at the one and a half times and the regulations that have been writ written about a work week and 168 hours of which 40 hours in a 168 hour contiguous period. And you, you look at all that and you say, we've designed almost all of our regulations and everything around people and how people work and how they operate our machines and how they drive our trucks and, and how they, they drill. But we're moving into a, a completely different world. And the reason that we're moving into it and there is because of technology. And so I, you read a lot of articles and there's some really good ones on automation and robotization. But I'd, I'd like for you to think about why that's going to be so impactful and why we as people have to understand what's going to happen. And it's because all of the things in that list that I just gave you are true. And as a consequence, we have the ability for even white collar jobs. And in fact, any job where there are rules associated with it to, to do the following thing, which I'm going to read through the list of sort of what automation and roboticization do for us. With, an, with robots and, and automation, we get reliability, we get consistency. They're still hard to train, uh, not so easy. They're loyal for life. They're predictable, they're easy to modify. They capture data by design. They're indefatigable. They have preventive maintenance. Uh, they have no rights yet, okay? Uh, they have scheduled maintenance, they're easy to relocate, they perform without supervision, and they still have operational costs. Okay. And when I look at these two lists and I balance them and I look at health care for people versus preventive maintenance for equipment, you, you know where companies are going to go because it's so much more inexpensive, it's, so, it's predictable. And so it's, it's not going to be because we don't like people and you read social articles and, and in fact I've been writing recently, I write on things that makes the bank very uncomfortable. I wrote on immigration and technology. We won't talk about that since this is streaming. Um, uh, I, I was going to write a paper this past week that was on the selection of Supreme Court justices and decided that probably wasn't a good idea either. Uh, we have a compliance division that gets really nervous and enjoys reading my work before it goes out. but. Uh, but when you, when you look at this, understand that the, the efforts in automation and the efforts in roboticization are to overcome every one of those issues that we as people, that's us being human. And we're, we're arriving at a point where being human is not going to be profitable. Now, you can go back and read Albert Hubbard, who was in the early 1900s. I, I love a quote that he made, which was, uh, uh, any machine can replace the work of 50 ordinary men. No machine can replace the work of an extraordinary man. And so when we look at how persons are today, if, if you don't really strive to be extraordinary, everything on this list on the left is going to cause you to really not be valuable. And so I don't know how we're going to progress in technology to have extraordinary students coming out of universities or to create an extraordinary workforce. But when you, you listen to Hubbard and you look at technology in the absence of being extraordinary, you're going to be replaced. And hence the articles on living wage, on what to do with unemployed, unemployment increasing. And, and people say, well, we're going to need people to build the robots and do the automation. But to be truthful, I can see a lot of automation today that's creating the next generation of automation without human input. And a lot of robotization that can create the robot that helps it do the next robot. So as I, as I look at that, I'm reasonably confident that uh, we're going to, uh, to, to get into a period of where being extraordinary should be our, our real mission as, as human beings. I look at power and I look at this bottle of water and, and uh, today in power, um, everything sort of breaks down. We all know this. I mean, uh, if we look at how power is generated today, and we're not talking about electric vehicles, somehow people get confused that electric vehicles somehow generate power. 
Uh, my, I've been in vehicles that transferred power from me to the tree, from me to other things, but um, it's, uh, they, they don't generate power. I, I work in the ag industry as well pretty often, and the ag industry and the oil and gas industry have a lot in common. Uh, when you open the refrigerator and there's food in there, there are people that don't understand that it doesn't grow in the refrigerator. <laughs> And uh, when people plug things into the wall, they, they're unaware that power's having to be generated someplace else. And the ag industry is actually suffering from people not really fully comprehending the farming that, that's required in order to generate crops. And we have a, a world that doesn't fully understand how, how power is created. But if we look at power, about 30% of it, and I'm going to round off, is it from oil. About 30% of it is from natural gas. We've got about 17 or 18 percent that's coming from coal. We have about 10 percent that's coming from nuclear, and then the rest of it's coming from renewables. Okay. Now they've made tremendous advances over the last decade, and so we've seen huge improvements in solar. We've made huge improvements in wind, and I'm going to make uh, some probably unpopular remarks about these things in a moment, but. Uh, and, and we're seeing the emergence of fuel cells, but fuel cells only make up about 0.02% of electric power generation today. And then we're seeing the emergence of waves. Now, as I look to tomorrow, and you're going to have a great speaker here in a moment on the panel, John Berger, who was at another conference yesterday, and I, I'm very impressed. He changed my thinking just listening to him. I was on a panel with him not so long ago. So if I had to, to list what the revolution's going to be, and I reordered things on what I think is coming, and I'm an oil and gas guy, but I'm going to reorder them, on, and I'll tell you why. I put solar first, then natural gas, then fuel cells, then nuclear, then oil, then biomass, then coal, then wind, and then wave. And so the reason I would order them in that and choose that order is because in, in talking to John, he has a concept called wireless power. And wireless power means that I can generate it exactly where I need it without having to have infrastructure to deliver it. And when you think of power in that mode, it changes your whole view of the planet and how we create energy today for our consumption, particularly in our homes. So you, if I use that as a, as, a, as a method for vetting things, I take a look at solar and I go, that's distributed power. It doesn't require infrastructure. I'll call it poles and wires to get it to me. I can put it on my roof, I can put it in my yard. Uh, there's a bit of variance in the intensity of it depending upon where you are on the planet, but by and large, I can have it local and I can use it local and it has the, the obnoxious quality of not being very functional when it's dark. Uh, natural gas, in abundance, yeah. We have the ability to manage natural gas and to manage leakage and to put sensors in and to do a great job as an industry delivering natural gas. But I really think of natural gas as a source of energy that gets converted to hydrogen. Because I think the fuel cell industry is one where you should follow closely. Because if you look at the car industry today, while all of us are worried about projecting EVs, the car manufacturers that really understand this are putting tremendous emphasis on fuel cells. And so I have an opportunity through working on a lithium company uh, to work with one of the car manufacturers and I'm very impressed with how they talk about it. So I'll share just a bit of that. When you talk to them, unlike some car manufacturers, I won't name them, I'm not gonna try to mm, cause me to receive any emails I have to respond to. Uh, the, there are some that talk about electric vehicles, and that's the, the whole of their story. We're going to release 22 new electric vehicles in this year, 27 in this year. You're going to see these models. And we worry about projecting this. In fact, even at the bank, people call in and say, what is your new EV forecast? And I go, and, but when you talk to really mature car companies, and I, I'll, I'll use Toyota and say a very advanced to mature car company, they, they're in the transportation business. They're, they're not in the, what, call, what turns the tires for them is whatever's going to be the best for them with regard to environmental compliance and consumer cost. And if we can somehow get chipmunks to run in a circle and not have to feed them that's, and, and move the vehicle, we'd have a chipmunk powered automobile. 
they really want to focus on low cost, low impact, no impact transportation and what goes under the hood's irrelevant, what turns the tires. And so they're equally balanced looking at electric vehicles, looking at fuel cells, looking at anything that might be in the future for, for turning the tires. And they have a great view of a car because they believe that a car could be a part of your home. And so that you'll pull into your home and there'll be some standardization, which we've never achieved with gasoline, where you can pull in and drive up and, and actually engage the, the whatever's charging your car. And I'm gonna talk about that in a moment, whether it's uh, EV or, or hydrogen, you'll pull in and connect and uh, your car becomes a room in your house so that you can go out and sit in a seat and, and read a novel, uh, and, and enjoy some relaxation. And so it's no longer just uh, uh, transportation, it's something where you spend time, you've designed it and customized it for yourself and chosen the colors. And so you're gonna end up with a designer room that uh, is somewhat automated and uh, standardized for fueling. And, and, and that can also be hydrogen. So again, back to no poles and wires. Uh, we were talking briefly earlier, but why no poles and wires? To, to transform energy in our, on our planet, we, we really need to eliminate something in order to afford the capital that's gonna be required to do the transformation. So you have to get rid of infrastructure in one place in order to be able to afford the infrastructure change that's going to have to occur. And I won't walk through numbers, but if we can eliminate poles and wires, by and large, then we'll have the money to go to our homes and put in solar, and we'll have the money to go to our homes and put in hydrogen. And we saw here in just the last day, there's a, a company called Syzygy Plasmonics that's an emerging company that's using photocatalytic technology. It's actually developed here at Rice Technology, I believe, and that they've licensed. And Syzygy takes natural gas and using light, they're able to perform what would be the Bosch Haber, pro the Haber Bosch process for, for chemistry and convert hydrogen off of natural gas streams without using temperature and pressure. So they're using LED lights, photocatalytic capabilities, streaming it through and producing pure hydrogen and CO2, which can be captured and managed. And, uh, and they're gonna do that at very low cost. In fact, we're seeing cost projections now for hydrogen that come in at below $2, in some cases below a dollar. And the, the way to think about this is that gasoline uh, price today, if you're at $2 a kilogram for hydrogen, that's roughly a gallon of gas equivalent in the, in the world. We can move it up and down a little based on oil and gas prices, but at $2 a kilogram, and we see sub $2 a, kil a kilogram hydrogen prices from these new technologies. We also see the, the ability to de develop and deliver hydrogen on demand, which means that you can eliminate some of the concerns about having the volatility of it in your home. You'll generate it as you need it, and you're not gonna have a huge surplus of it that, that's sitting there and, uh, and, and creates any risk. So think about a world in energy where oil's gonna be really important and we're not gonna talk about it very much. It'll be the industry that used to dominate conversation and it's gonna be an industry that's really profitable, probably supplies a lot larger volume of natural gas, still supplies oil, but we, we're not on the front page of the paper because we'll simply go out of people's uh, minds because they're going to be focused on all the other things that begin to emerge and take the top of the list. And so we go from being villains to just another contributor to the quality of life and trying to address energy poverty on the planet. Um, the last one is one that I, I find the most perplexing for me because it's just very hard to talk about and, and get any credibility when you're an oil and gas person to say that you care about the planet. And the moment you say that, you just are seen as a, um, a pariah by the people that are in the industry or an idiot by the people from outside the industry that believe you're just promoting your own industry and saying that you're going to take care of the environment. The truth is, I believe uh, both of those things are true. <laughs> um, I know some people in our industry now, and 
that uh, when I see their marketing material on their, their, the importance of the environment, I, I know that probably doesn't match their behavior. I see others that their behavior exceeds anything that I would expect from an oil and gas company in uh, protecting the environment and the importance of it. And so, and that's big and small. And so there are some people out there setting the standard for how they think about uh, environmental compliance. But the problems on the planet are really complex. And I, I don't know, you know, how many of you could come to the board and, and draw the carbon cycle and understand how plants absorb carbon during the spring and, and as they decompose and fall off, they release it again, or how farming and, and sequestration of it in the soil impacts things, or the fact that the ocean has been sort of overcoming our sins for years and has, has absorbed as much as 30% of the CO2, and it'll release it again as we, we begin to reduce CO2 in the atmosphere. It's gonna have to give some of it back in order to sort of de, de acidize itself. And so, and how to understand all of that is really difficult. Um, it, it's not for the faint of heart. You have to put a lot of effort in being a, uh, a, a knowledgeable about how this whole system works and, and the quantity of it and then the impacts we have on the planet. So I find CO2 to be a topic uh, noteworthy of, of your effort. You, you know, at night when you are sitting there watching the news, which ceases to be the news anymore, it's hard to find facts, you know, go find some facts on CO2 and, and educate yourself and understand how the industry is going to work on CO2. It, uh, short-lived climate pollutants, boy, that's a fancy word, you know, we've now taken greenhouse gas uh, components and we've broken them down, we understand their absorption rates, we understand their half-lives, much like radiation in the atmosphere, and each one of these gets targeted and then restated in CO2. And so, uh, and many of the gases that we've talked about over the past uh, from fluorocarbons on, I mean, they, they have the equivalent of putting a thousand times the CO2 into the atmosphere over those periods. And so, you know, small quantities of that equal large quantities of CO2. And we, we continue to talk about CO2, but it's everything that combines that. Uh, global warming potential. Um, boy, there's papers coming out every day. If I were to walk through that with you right now and give you the formulas, tomorrow would be wrong. And so the, being on top of that for people that are serious about climate change it, it's, is absolutely critical and, and infinitely difficult. And so, you know, how do we do that? What ratios do we use? And for those of you that are petroleum engineers or, or reservoir engineers that might be listening, it's a, um, we used to use a tortuosity factor, right? Which uh, we, we used in any equation where the answer that we had didn't match what we observed. Uh, that exists in every profession. <laughs> the tortuosity factor, you know, and we gave it a great name because it obfuscated the fact that we just didn't know, so we adjusted stuff, right? And, uh, and when we look at uh, the global warming potentials and how those, those numbers are done, there's a lot of adjustments that are being made. Now, when you do those adjustments, uh, if you don't believe that climate is uh, really an issue, then you think that these people are just fudging things all around. If you do believe, you believe that they haven't uh, given enough weight to carbon. And so in truth, we don't know what the number should be. It's kind of a fudge factor to sort of match what, what's going on. And, and we apply these fudge factors, uh, tortuosity, to the atmosphere, much like we have to reservoirs. And uh, as, a, as a consequence of doing that, we, uh, we end up with uh, a, a really harsh debate, but has calmed down uh, tr tremendously. So if I looked at public sentiment by reading, and, and this is frightening for me a bit, by, by reading uh, through research articles and polls, and you can go to Pew Research and others, um, if we looked at Earth Day as an example, and we looked at participation in Earth Day from its origin, which actually was from Santa Barbara. Uh, you know, senators flying over Santa Barbara and observing the spill there and becoming quite upset. And so we created a day to ob observe the environment we call Earth Day. This coming year, 2019, they're going to identify 52 species. And those, each week you're going to see a new endangered species highlighted by Earth Day. But in 2010, the number of people began to decline that were participating in that, even though it ramped up really quick in the U.S. and then globally. But now it's, it's, it's beginning to turn, turn over a bit. And I'm hoping that uh, you're going to have the, the, I think it's the 50th year will be 2020. So it'll be from 1970 to 
to 2020 will be their 50th year. And it's actually an important day to have people think about it. But now you can easily confuse on Earth Day where we're looking at the, the whole of the planet to what anybody here ever heard of Earth Overshoot Day? Anybody Earth Overshoot Day? Okay, we got a couple of folks and a lot of people that are embarrassed to acknowledge that they know. Um, so Earth Overshoot Day, uh, AKA it's a, a, a better name for it might be um, Earth, uh, unbalanced ledger day, right? So what they've done is they started out in 1969 or so, and they said that uh, with the earth, that we used 100% of its resources over 365 days. And then we began to calculate how much we used each year based on that scale. And we begin to move the days back because it turns out that we were using up all of the resources prior. And I'll, I'll give an example of fisheries and I'll stop here. Uh, and so they, they started moving it to this past year, Earth Overshoot Day, our ability to use all of the resources without them with the ability to replenish. Okay, we hit that day on August the 15th. It's kind of like tax day for the earth, right? So on August 15th, we had overused all of the resources. And we're generating more CO2. We're out of balance on CO2, which is one of the big measures for Earth Overshoot Day. We achieved that by August 15th. And so every day after August 15th, we really are creating emissions that the planet can't deal with. Okay, or we're using resources the planet can't replenish. Now, that's a bit scary, and, and you can go and read this, and you'll argue the way they do it, but, uh, but you can look at fisheries, and I think fisheries one of the really the coolest ones. You know, over the last 40 years, we consume about 90 million tons of fish a year, and fish being consumed is going up in double digits. Kager on, on fish consumption is up in the 12, 14% range. Right? You want to be in the fish business. We have not, so that's 90 million tons 50 years ago, 45, 50 years ago. Today, we're consuming about 170 million tons. And so we've been going up steadily at 12, 14% now, right? And it, it's growing. People are consuming more and more fish. But we have not increased our catch naturally for almost 30 years. We still are at 90 million tons per year of natural fishery contribution, and we're doing all of the remainder, which is about almost equal to the 90 million from aquaculture. And so all of those fish are coming from the fact we're farming them. And so you can begin to see that there are ways to go forward where we can achieve a planet that's balanced. And I think the revolution is going to occur when, when we take in this industry very seriously climate change, that we, we address it in aquaculture, we address it in farming, we address it in CO2 emissions and uh, electric fracking. I mean, we're, we're looking at electric fracking becoming the standard in oil and gas. It will be the standard in the next three to five years. I believe this. Today, there's 17 units running, okay, out of a, an enormous frack fleet. Why will we do that? $5,000 an hour cheaper to operate, uses natural gas in the field, much lower CO2 emissions, absolutely quiet, and no diesel, $5,000 an hour of diesel not used, plus the trucks to haul the diesel in and to haul the, and go back out. And so we're moving to a much kinder, gentler industry, even though we're gonna to continue to produce oil. Um, I'd, I'd say, think about people. A lot of you may not have jobs. Um, most of the ones here with white hair, we don't really need to worry about this. We just hope you've stored up enough that you don't need to work. Um, but, but young people, if you're not going to be extraordinary, you got a difficult life ahead. When it comes to power, look at fuel cells and hydrogen. This is going to be cheap, effective, and the world's going to love it. And when it comes to the planet, we all better take a serious uh, look at our role in, in protecting it. And thank you very much. We have a couple of minutes for some questions, so uh, please walk to the mic, introduce yourself. And I'm Dr. Geologist. Um, you had some interesting lists, and your first list described a lot of the bosses I've had over the years. Um, but your list of, of you worked uh, for me, did you? Uh, <laughs> no. Uh, your your um, proposed uh, or your anticipated energy ranking. You didn't mention geothermal, particularly non-utility scale geothermal. Any thoughts? You know, I can. I, sh I should have put it on there. It ranks well above wave energy. Um, I, you know, we were talking earlier. I, I tried to just rank things that I thought were fairly low 
down. I think geothermal is going to have great opportunity and it'll grow quite well. Uh, the trouble with geothermal though is a bit like wind in that I have to take the power from where I'm generating it in, in a lot of highly populated areas to another area so it requires infrastructure and it's the reason I didn't put it on there. I am not a wind guy. The wind blows in places really hard where they're not people so it means I can capture energy there. Uh, it has environmental consequences but then I've got to deliver it to someplace else. And so I'm not a big delivery guy. I really like the wireless power concept that John's going to talk about. And so I didn't put wind or geothermal there. But for local environments, right, it's going to be really great. And any place we can offset uh, you know, creating carbon dioxide with other forms of power, I think we're, we're going to be obligated to do that. So if you're in a hot spot in Hawaii or Iceland or others, it makes no sense not to, to base your economy off uh, geothermal energy. Hi, uh, Carter Kittrell, uh, Chemistry Department at Rice. Um, I really like some of these great ideas you're putting forth, wireless power. I think this was first uh, put forth by Nikola Tesla, so uh, maybe that will have its day. Um, but the question I have is, I grew up about 100 miles north of Pittsburgh, and we need, by far, the greatest need for power is in the winter. It gets very cold. Uh, the coldest days, there's no wind and there's no sun. Um, and so, uh, how do you get renewable power to the Northeast, our largest consumption of power, when there's nothing of, that's of local, of, you know, that's available? And, you know, trying to imagine moving solar power from Arizona, you know, 100 gigawatts of power would require some, a lot of more power lines than we have now. Well, you know, the whole Tesla argument here, you, you wish we'd have gone to D.C. because we lose so much power due to, uh, to heat. And, uh, you know, we, we really didn't choose the best. It's like VHS versus beta. We may not have taken the best technology there. And as a consequence, we, we pay an energy loss through the transmission. So how do we get it up there? One opportunity would be to move all of you south. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, would be opportunity. I found that to be true in a lot of places based on my neighbors. But th I think that's why natural gas and hydrogen, so I'll, I'll go back to fuel cells. You, with the Marcellus, you've got tremendous opportunity for low-cost gas in that area if you allow them to drill. And uh, in using natural gas and hydrogen conversion, fuel cells can offset those days when you're not going to have solar energy available and we don't want you to burn wood and, and coal in the fireplace. And, and so, again, the list was really trying to think through every area and, and understanding that uh, fuel cells will make up a big part of it because I think natural gas is, uh, is ubiquitous at the moment, the way that we understand shales today. And uh, you've got that opportunity. And, and you're going to see hydrogen generators that make this, I think, very affordable that are, are going to scale in the, in the next five years from at your home to uh, at large, at, at really large complexes. Okay, but the Northeast then will still remain basically carbon-based a source of energy in the winter. Still got to capture CO2 and, right. and handle that. And so uh, hopefully other speakers will talk about the solids that are coming, adsorption, resorption, uh, direct air capture. I mean, we, we've got a big obligation on CO2, and it's a topic that we could talk about. And I think the, the secretary is going to talk about it after lunch as well, and carbon tax and the direction of carbon. That, it's, uh, it, that in of itself is a revolution, but uh, we'll, we'll leave that for the secretary. Everybody join me in thanking John. Oh, good. Good, thank you. I'd like to call up our first panel. This is to make sure we're on time. <laughs> Good morning. I'd like to start off this morning by thanking our panelists to be here. I'm Megan Burge with Baker Botts. I'm fortunate today to be our moderator. Energy transition is generally defined as a long-term structural change in energy systems. And it has been said that the electricity sector is dominating the modern energy transition. So it's truly fitting that this is our first panel of the day. 
The panel this morning is uniquely qualified to talk about the modern energy transition and the factors that are shaping this change. With me today is Jim Steffes, Executive Vice President of Cor and Corporate Affairs for Direct Energy, which is one of the largest retail providers of electricity, natural gas, and home and business energy-related services. Emily Fisher, VP and Corporate Secret Secretary for the Electric Edison Institute, the trade association that represents all domestic <laughs> electric utilities. John Zarancic, the CEO, COO of AES Energy Storage, who recently helped launch Fluence, which delivers best-in-class energy storage systems. And John Berger, who, no pressure after the last speaker, <laughs> um, is the founder and CEO of Sonova Energy, an apparently changer of minds. Um, it's the leading privately held U.S. residential solar and energy storage provider. So before I jump into the hard questions for our panel, I thought we should start off with just explaining a little bit more detail about your companies and your, your associations and how they fit in today's energy market. So John, if you would like to start off. Get us started, huh? Well, good morning. How's everybody doing? Sonoba Energy Corporation is the one of the largest residential solar and now storage service providers in the United States. So what we do through a network of dealers is we go out and we basically uh, you know, sign customers up for long-term agreements and our dealers install solar equipment. And now I get to tell you this year that uh, it, it, this is moving far faster than I thought. We can talk more about that, I'm sure. Uh, but we also increasingly saw, install uh, storage or lithium ion batteries from different manufacturers. We're also increasingly looking at and moving forward installing control electronics to basically manage each home like a nano grid or a mini utility system. And then we operate all these tens of thousands of homes across the United States. We operate every, uh, near Japan and Guam and Saipan, all the way through Hawaii, all the way through to Puerto Rico. And yes, there's plenty of stories there from a year ago storm. And then from Texas to Massachusetts. So when we look at the world, what we see is a very quick not a 20, 30 years, you know, this change will take a long time, but we see a very quick movement in both pricing and technological improvement on solar and storage, control electronics, and indeed on things, as Mr. Gibson said, even on fuel cells. We, we are starting to see Japan move into fuel cells in a pretty big way, and we think that may even move over into other parts of the world as well. What we'd like to see is a world, as I spoke about this in, in this hall last year, where everybody has a choice of what energy they want and how they want it. Full consumer choice, let the people choose. So we are not anti-oil and gas at all. What we want is people to be able to choose the power that they want. And if we think that people want more reliable with storage and other technologies on the home and in the business, and cleaner and more dependable and cheaper power. And the technological revolution that we're talking about here is a confluence of technologies, not just solar, not just storage, not just control electronics, maybe not just fuel cells and other technologies, some of which we may not even contemplate here today, but it's a confluence of technologies that is going to change the energy landscape, and indeed it is changing the energy landscape at a very fast rate. I'll, I'll say and close this before I turn it over to my colleagues. I will tell you that it's amazing to me how much we underestimate the pace of change. It's, it, it's human nature to think about change in the sense of linear fashion. And indeed, there's been no technology in human history in 500 years that's ever been adopted in linear fashion, including fracking. It's an S-curve. And we are in that exponential part of the S-curve. We're sweeping across. And so when you look at where we are today versus where you think we'll be in five years, you're underestimating the pace of change. I guarantee it. We're seeing a huge transformation. As recently as this morning, I was, I was reminded where it looks like Sears may be liquidated. 
Who would have thought that just a few years ago? Who would have thought about the smartphone even 10 years ago? Who would have thought, remember those days, and I'm probably dating myself, where Amazon and online shopping was just too risky? And now we look and fear Amazon could gobble the entire planet of business, right? Change happens faster than we can process in our human brain, and it is happening faster in energy today. Am I up next, Megan? You are. We're right. just going to rotate John, down. John kind of got into the meat of the conversation, and I, I'm going to resist the temptation, although I think those are great framing comments to talk about change and, and customer choice. So the Edison Electric Institute, as Megan noted, is the trade association that represents all investor-owned electric companies in the United States. Um, we serve customers in all 50 states. It's about 220 million people. Um, we do the generation, the transmission, and the distribution. I still think there's uh, going to be poles and wires for a while, and we can talk about why that is. Um, and uh, our members are, uh, I think, the key entities for actually implementing change in a lot of these places, because a lot of the stuff that we're going to talk about doesn't make sense if you're not interconnected to a larger system. And a lot of the technologies don't become affordable for customers, and that's a big part of the conversation that often gets left out. Everyone's going to have fuel cells. How are they going to pay for them? The way they pay for them is selling services back to the grid. There has to be a grid in order for there to be services sold back to it. And those services are valuable, and we need to figure out how to value and price them for everyone. But I think a future in which we are gridless and you know, without poles and wires doesn't make sense, because your technologies also don't make sense without a larger grid. And in closing, I'll just say um, there's a reason why um, years ago, we interconnected the entire power system. It's because it makes it more reliable, and it's to deal with the question that one of the panelists, the uh, questioners posed to our amazing first speaker, which is what do you do when the sun doesn't shine? How do you deal when it's really cold out? You use that system to provide affordable, reliable power to everybody and to use all of the resources that we need to provide that to customers. So thank you. Jim, you're up next. Great. Um, Welcome. Uh, Jim Steffes, I'm with Direct Energy. Direct Energy is a, um, the North American subsidiary of a company by the name of Centrica, which was formed when um, uh, Margaret Thatcher privatized and liberalized the energy markets in the UK. You know, our business today, and it's evolved since that time, is, is serving the evolving needs of our customers with uh, uh, gas, electricity, and services. We're an energy and services company. We uh, uh, participate in the E&P business, we participate in the LNG markets, but more and more what we're about is um, uh, addressing at the uh, request of our customers, and so we're very customer-centric, and I think that's the fundamental transformation that we're talking about. I think it, uh, Emily and John sort of hit at it, but the fundamental question is, is we've been in a world in the 20th century where we've been talking about not customers but barrels of oil or meters or load, and I think the 21st century is going to be talking about customers and allowing customers to express their preferences. And the, the big transformation, and it is a discontinuity, uh, we're in a dynamic period of change in the power sector. The things we talk about and that we're trying to help our customers address with different technologies and different services is digitization. So we're moving from an analog world, and specifically in the power space, from an analog world to a digital world. And that's happening rapidly. We now have 70 million smart meters in North America. The amount of sensor capacity and information we can pick up is huge in this space, and it's becoming more and more. And when we get that data, of course, then we let the robots go to work on it. Um, um, distributed. Right now, the space, we fundamentally are very centralized. We're very top-down. I think more and more will be decentralized, distributed. I think you'll see this. While not everyone will have a distributed asset at some point in the future, when you think about efficiency and demand response, the ability to change customers' appetite during periods of cold or heat, as well as distributed assets, I think that will be a big part of it. Um, decarbonized. And I think this is something where, again, I, I, we're a believer, while government will drive some conversations about the carbon question, uh, greenhouse gas, however you want to look at it, the, 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 the question of carbon. Consumers will go much faster than we can imagine, and they're much more willing to have conversations around questions of sustainability 
uh, in light of affordability and reliability. But decarbonization is happening, and we need to let customers express that preference. Um, but the most important part, and I keep using the word customers, and this is where the 21st century is so exciting for companies like Direct and Centrica. It's really the, the big, and you notice all these things start with Ds, and I, I can keep going, but the fourth D, as I like to say, is design. Because this is where the 21st century is, is allowing individuals, businesses, and homes. And you see it at the corporate level today. The amount of corporates that are demanding 100% green uh, has gone from 10 to 150. And you, you even had Google post something yesterday where they're not just talking about uh, renewable energy sort of in aggregate, but in fact at a minute by minute kind of level. That's a fundamental shift. And it's, it's not just the big corporates that will be doing this in the next few years. It will be down to the household level that we will be designing energy paths. And I think that's the amazing innovation. And those are the things that Centrica is working on. I think that's the transformation we're about. The, where it is natural gas, oil, nuclear, whatever that is, let's let customers express that preference through price, through a marketplace, and I think you'll get a better answer for everyone faster. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is John Zorancic. I represent a company called Fluence. Uh, Fluence was formed just at the beginning of this year. It was referenced a bit in the opening remarks as a joint venture between the AES Corporation and Siemens. Um, I have been with the AES Corporation over the last uh, decade working on battery-based energy storage systems. Uh, we've done some of the largest in the world. Uh, we've done many of the firsts in the world. And today, Fluence, which inherited that legacy from AES and Siemens, uh, has battery-based storage systems connected to the power grid in 17 countries. Uh, we have another 10 or 12 countries that are actively looking at the ways to incorporate battery-based systems into their network um, as a way to improve the reliability of those power systems, reduce the cost of those systems, and manage uh, the emissions and output of those systems. Uh, I, batteries wasn't noted on the opening list, and I think I won't take that as a slight so much as a notice that they don't actually create electricity. Um, and they don't, um, but they do belong in the power sector as a way to create a great deal of more efficiency and reliability within that system. So today, uh, the electricity system is one of the few systems where we have to actually create the, the, the item that we're consuming essentially in the instant that we need to consume it. Um, there's very little ability to store electricity other than as in another form as fuel. Um, and today we're now introducing more and more ways to store that to introduce efficiency and reliability into that power system while reducing the need to overbuild elements of the system to achieve that same reliability. And that's mostly what we've been focused on. And it's effectively hybridizing the power grid the way that we've been looking at hybridizing transportation and other things. Bringing batteries and other storage technologies into that system to lower cost, to lower the ways that we have to run the other units that are around, whether those be coal machines, natural gas generators, renewable generators, we can smooth out the production of that electricity, we can ensure that we have reliability, um, and these battery systems are going in, in many cases, as an alternate, a supplement, or a substitute for new power generation, uh, new wires and poles investments, and in some cases at the customer's premise to help them manage their consumption. So a variety of ways that we're using battery energy storage. Fluence was created really to span that full market from uh, commercial and industrial implementations all the way up to the largest utility scale energy storage systems. Uh, today we've done things uh, at an original scale when we started this back in 2006 and 2007, we were looking at energy storage systems on the scale of about one megawatt that could handle loads for 15 minutes. Today we're installing systems that are on the order of 100 megawatts that handle loads for four and five hours. As we continue to see the technology cost curve emerge and we value these properties, we're going to longer and longer duration, larger and larger systems, and we're embedding them in more and more places throughout the power system. So this is another one of the transitions. It moves along with the distribution of power to different locations. It moves along with the digitalization and control of power. These storage systems give you much more accurate, very fast reactive control over power flows in a way that allows us to take cost out of the system and manage reliability much more effectively. Thank you all. I think we just heard a array of views on exactly what the transition is as we were going on. When we were preparing for the panel, everyone said, well, what exactly is this transition? And I think the next question that we agreed on was, what would accelerate it or impede the transition? And this time we're going to start with Emily and go around. 
Thank you. Um, well, first, I'd just like to frame a little bit of the transition since we, we touched on it a little bit. I think the, the two things that the panel agreed on is that we're incorporating more distributed resources into the system. So we're taking a system that was designed to generate electricity away from population centers in big units and move it to people. And now we're adding things, particularly onto the distribution system, that make that power go two ways. And we're inc incorporating more distributed resources into that system. And that's a pretty fundamental change just in terms of like engineering. Totally manageable, but it's not the way that, um, in particular, the regulatory systems were devised. So there's, a, there's this transition. The technology is driving it. I think one of our conversations about one of the impediments is how does the regulatory system keep up? Because it is not designed for that right now. And a lot of the tension isn't about whether or not we should do these things, or these things make sense, or these things are what customers want, or these would make a system more affordable or reliable. It's how we squish something that wasn't designed for uh, this regulatory model into the existing regulatory model. And we're not very good at having conversations about how the regulatory model should change. Um, the other thing that I wanted to highlight in terms of the transition is, is about the carbon issue, which is um, already happening in the power sector. We're not waiting for hydrogen um, to decarbonize the power sector. In fact, if you look at the mix of generating resources that we used in 2007 and the mix we used in 2017, it is dramatically different. Um, we used to get about 50% or more. This is nationally, regionally. You could look at even more extreme numbers. We used to get 50% or more of our power from coal. In 2018, we'll probably get less than 30 nationally. And in some parts of the country, we're in single digits. Like California doesn't use coal at all. We are closing the last remaining coal plants on the West Coast. So what's replacing that? Dramatic increase in the use of natural gas, dramatic increase in the amount of renewables that are deployed on a capacity basis, still pretty small in terms of energy generated basis. But also, again, if you look at that on a regional level, you would see in the mid part of the country not being a fan of wind aside, you know, in the upper northwest, they're getting around 20% of their power from wind. Um, and it's a lot. And on some days, they're getting 50 or 70 or even more percent of their power from, uh, from renewables, but in wind in those particular areas. So what does that mean for carbon? At the end of 2017, um, the power sector as a whole, so my members, including uh, municipal utilities and rural electric cooperatives, had reduced their total carbon emissions 28% below 2005 levels. It's, it's dramatic. That far outpaces what any other industry has done, and it far outpaces what's happened anywhere else in the world. And so it makes electricity a possible way of dealing with emissions in other industries. And you look at electrification, not just of the transportation sector, but you see port electrification. You look at electrification of, this is transportation, but fleets. Um, there's a lot of applications to take carbon out of the system. And, and maybe we don't know what the numbers are for the right amount of carbon, but most people generally agree if you're concerned about carbon that less is better than more. And electricity provides an opportunity to do that. So what are the impediments? We don't have a price for carbon. And it makes it hard to figure out what, are, what would be the most efficient, what would be the most um, economically beneficial ways of using electricity and other technologies to reduce carbon. But we, we don't have a carbon price in this country, and it makes it complicated. Thanks, Emily. Jim? Um, so uh, I, I guess a couple of thoughts. In, in, a, in the last point, I'll just jump. I think we have a price for carbon in the United States. It's just wrong. It's zero. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, it's, it's an important point, because I think sometimes we have this conversation, we need, a, we need a price for carbon. We have a price for carbon. Everybody has you know, their spreadsheets. The bankers have their spreadsheets. They have a little cell. It's just zero today. Um, and we just know that zero is the wrong price. So anyway, we can talk about that later. Um, what, what are the, the biggest factors, or what will the biggest factor in terms of moving this transformation? Um, you know, and again, I think the other piece, we're, we're talking about global energy today. Sometimes, we're, most of the time, we're going to talk about North American context. The North American context for electricity is relatively a dull conversation, because unfortunately, there's not a lot of load growth. And, and I don't know if I'll be a robot in the future or not, but I would tell my children, don't go into an industry where there's no growth. Um, um, that's, that's sort of thought. Now, there will be growth. It just will all take place primarily um, um, outside of the OECD countries. There's a lot of growth in energy. Um, but in the North American context in the United States, I think the, the thing that will either help drive um, this transformation faster uh, and be more effective and more efficient or slow it down is how um, firmly we place customers 
individual customers into the middle of the conversation. As a retailer, so my company serves 20 million plus homes and businesses around the world. The one thing I've learned as running these businesses is, is there's, a, there's a fundamental problem in a retail business. It's called the focus group of one. Um, which means that, I, so I'll be sitting there making the final decision on product and I'll say, that product is horrible because I would never buy that product. Well, again, I'm almost certain in the context of electricity markets, gas markets, pretty much any other market, I am the least best person to make choices about what most other people will do. And, and I think we end up in this world because it is heavily regulated, heavily overseen by policymakers, heavily driven by um, um, technocrats, that we want those answers that those people see. And I think empowering consumers, allowing them to design the path, putting them in the center of this conversation, where we have fundamental uh, um, natural monopolies, and that's an open question, I think, between John and Emily at some point, is where does the natural monopoly end or not? But where we have fundamental natural monopolies, we should oversee them and allow them to provide the platform that we want to see grow. Everything else, should be done by uh, business people and homeowners and families in driving their own path. It'll be faster and more effective and more efficient than we can ever imagine. Thank you. John? Yeah, that's right. yeah I, I would point out maybe two impediments to transitions that I see. Um, one is I, would, I think it's sort of like the refrigerator problem. If you already own a refrigerator, how many more refrigerators do you need? Um, and so we already own a lot of power infrastructure you know that we have these power generating plants that when we built them we committed to thinking these were 30 and 40 and 50 year assets we have transmission systems that were expected to last a long time um, and even when we replace them we kind of do what all of us do with our old refrigerator we stick it in the basement and we keep using it so the emissions don't completely go away uh, they sort of get reduced a little bit and even if the best new refrigerator comes out on the market it's smart robotic orders everything for you, I probably don't really need a new refrigerator for a few years until my one starts breaking down. So we've got this inertia refrigerator problem in the power sector. Change happens slowly um, because we have a lot of embedded investment. The, the key, uh, I think, to making that change happen, and I, and I fully agree with John's premise on things happen on an S-curve, they do accelerate. Um, part of it is when do we start looking at these alternatives in these uh, planning exercises that we have? You know, many of the uh, decisions are made by policymakers, are made by utilities and others that have long planning horizons because the infrastructure has taken a long time to put in place. They're serious investments. If it takes us five years to recognize that there's an alternate to the planning and then it takes another five years to put something in, you know, that's a long horizon. So I think one of the challenges we have is really incorporating new technologies, new approaches into the planning cycle, making sure that there's tool, uh, excuse me, tools available to do that. Uh, one of the challenges we've seen with energy storage is the tools that um, planning planners use for transmission planning, generation planning, resource adequacy, even for looking at uh, reliability and cost planning, they don't have energy storage in that tool. That's not an option. You can choose gas plant, coal plant, combined cycle plant, geothermal plant. We haven't incorporated energy storage into that planning. We look back and we see things like pumped hydro. Um, pumped hydro has been tremendously effective and helpful uh, at, at helping to manage the cost and reliability of the power system. But we have to begin to incorporate a more dynamic set of tools so that we can think about planning and shorten that cycle. Um, the other impediment, I would say, is um, in addition to maybe not pricing carbon accurately, we don't really price flexibility accurately. And, and so today, we take it for granted that when we flip the lights on, they come on. Um, and we think mostly about energy in terms of the cost of the megawatt hour, kilowatt hour that I consume. The kilowatt hour that I consume is actually a relatively small part of my bill. There's a big part of the bill that is all the poles and wires, all of the backup systems, ancillary support to make sure that every time you turn the light on, that whole system functions to bring you power from wherever it's coming to in a reliable fashion. Um, and as we go into a, a world where there's less certainty about where those sources of power and electricity will be coming from, exactly how much will be consumed at what time, we're shifting loads, we're getting smarter about that, 
Um, we're not valuing flexibility and optionality the way that other industries value that. And, and we're not giving pricing signals to saying, building a more flexible power system that can deal with changes that might come over the next five years, 10 years, 30 years, um, and making sure that we don't have stranded investment assets, um, those often aren't given as much consideration as I think they could be. Um, and building in flexibility, noting that we're going into a period of transition. So I, I think those are two elements that I would look at as impediments to change. John? Well, uh, Emily mentioned to me earlier that we probably agree on many things, and she's right, uh, surprisingly. So, we do. Uh, we do, and, uh, and, and maybe we can solve a lot of the industry problems right here in front of everybody this morning. Um, I'll put net metering vacation. on the table. If, if we solve them, I could use a vacation, that'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's do it. And I think there's a lot amount of agreement across uh, the panel. Uh, if you listen to all of these um, different ideas about what gets in the way, it, it is, and, and, and there is a large amount of agreement that the current regulatory system in the U.S. power industry is broken completely. And, you know, we have different ideas, I'm sure, Emily, about how to do it the right way from our different vantage points. But I would also point out to something that John, uh, Jim and John just said is, I often say that, you know, if it was up to just putting four smart people or even just close the doors and we'll figure it out, if that was the way that you, we could find a way forward in anything in an economy and life, the Soviets would have won the Cold War. And the last time I looked, they didn't. Um, and I remarked around all some of the pictures around here about the, that era with Secretary Baker. and. And we, even when you look at, and I'm sure the secretary will talk about his idea about putting a carbon tax out there and basically putting a price more than zero, as Jim said, uh, on carbon, that is a fairly market-based approach. And that's what we need to do. The reason why we're having this conversation, if you think about it, and you have to go back in time just a little bit so you can move forward and figure out you know, where we're gonna go. History is important. When we talk about a centralized system, and we, and we just kind of skip through that, that was true because the fuel source, the energy source was centralized, and the conversion technology from the BTU to the megawatt hour was centralized because that was the most efficient way of doing it in terms of the conversion. The very first major power plant, Niagara Falls, obviously a centralized power source. The conversion technology, steam turbines ran out the wires. There you go. Coal by wire was the rallying cry in the 1920s and 30s. That's where most of the infrastructure was built, and that's where a lot of still the lines today were built. They're in service today in the Midwest in particular. And then you move into, yes, you have oil fire generation, not the best use of oil, I think we could all agree, but it is, it and dominates the islands in terms of the Pacific and the Caribbean and other places in the world. And then last time I looked, you can't have a nuclear power plant in your backyard. That doesn't exactly work. Actually, it probably doesn't work anywhere at any size, but you know, we needed wires there. And we built a lot of wires out, especially the federal government with TVA and so forth in, in the 1970s and 1980s. And then we had gas turbine technology, and that was a little different. Gas is distributed, and this is why I'd say this. Stop saying renewables. You're thinking about it wrong. Solar and wind have absolutely nothing in common, other than the fact that we can claim that we have carbon-free electricity, and we can have that argument. It, one is a centralized rotating machinery. It's nothing disparaging about wind. It's just fundamentally different. And this gets to my point. Solar is fundamentally different than anything we've had. Even gas, where it can be distributed through LDCs, and many of your members like Centerpoint have gone on to buy up like veteran with localized distribution companies to take advantage of that. But even when you look at gas, the centralized technology, unless fuel cells do come of light, which is possible, according to Mr. You know, Mr. Gibson, I, I believe what he's seen, and I'm certainly seeing that, but a centralized conversion technology is the most efficient. For solar, the fuel is the sun. It's clearly distributed. And the conversion technology, it's an inherently distributed technology. You, yes, you can put it in solar farms, but then you have to get it from nowhere to somewhere to use it. And that costs a lot of money. 
And so when, when we're talking about decentralized versus centralized, consumer-centric versus monopoly command and control error and, and way of doing things, the reason why we're having these arguments right now is solar. That's it. That's what's causing this, coupled with battery, because you have to store it. And I will tell you that last year we talked about the, you know, what are you going to do when the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine? I'm sick of hearing, we're going to get a battery, right, John? We've got plenty of them. We have a lot of them. And I will tell you that, that I will also say that we don't need the grid as much as they, you would like to think. In fact, I have customers that are off-grid, and more and more are calling us and saying, can I go off-grid? It doesn't mean, to be clear about this, I think a world in which we have a balanced of a centralized system and a decentralized system is the best way to go for society. And it's the best thing for overall. And I hope we end up there. So what that means is it looks a lot like the telecommunication system. We have a balance of centralized assets. And we have decentralized assets. We push the investment to the endpoints of the system, the capabilities to the endpoints of the system. And I would also say this. There's no one system. I've traded it, I've run utility from the control room. There's many systems, and we have a very balkanized system in the United States, both in the sense of what the physical infrastructure is, but also there's over 5,000 utilities in the United States. Most countries have one to seven. That creates all these issues, and what we can do in the major impediment is not necessarily the technology. The technology will progress, it's allowing consumers to see how the technology is progressing, to put their money where, where they want it to be put, to send the market signals like we see in any other industry, and then let it go. And if, if people don't sign up for Sonova's power service because we didn't do a good enough job at attracting the customers, that's shame on me. Okay, so now can we fight a little bit? Yep. Okay. So, <laughs> so I, I was I, trying to be nice. No, 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 no. But, but I, I, know this is, I meant that a little bit facetiously. But this is a conversation I'd like to have because what you basically were arguing for is let customers choose and let markets dictate. But right now, in order for customers, by and large, to afford solar and storage, those things need to be heavily subsidized. Wrong. Well, that's what's happening. Your so, heavily, your industry is heavily subsidized because it's a monopoly. And I, and I'll give up the ITC and that meeting right now if you deregulate completely. Give consumers choices. So let the people choose. States, I have like 30 some odd states, including the District of Columbia, have deregulated and have allowed consumers access to choose their own power supplier. Do you know how many customers actually do that? Very few. So it's not a question of giving customers choice. Then you shouldn't it's, be worried about it. I'm not worried Let about it. Let consumers have choice. I, Let's make it I work. I did not say this wasn't about choice. I'm saying right now you want to deploy technologies and you say that customers want them, but they're not necessarily affordable right now. And so, you know, if people want to go off the grid, that's great. I, it's, I believe that customers have that choice. Companies would let them do that. It's, it's easy to accomplish. But most customers aren't choosing to do that for reasons. And one of the reasons is that in order to make those systems currently affordable, they need to get money from the grid in order to have them make economic sense for individual customers. That's not true. Customers. They're getting but money from me. But they're getting money from you. But they need to get money from somebody so they can. But you're getting money by selling services to them and then also to me and to my folks. I'm right? not selling anything to any utility. OK. Then, then go for it. But I think that's not what's going to happen to most customers. That's not what most customers are opting to do. And I was on a panel with a woman from Tesla earlier this year. She's a young woman who admitted that she herself couldn't afford the Tesla battery pack. We think we need to have some sort of recognition about where the technologies are and the fact that energy prices, and in particular electricity prices, can be some of the most regressive um, prices that people pay. So how are we ensuring that you want customer choice, but I think you're just talking about upper echelon customers. What you want to do is pick off like rich, nice customers who are easy to serve, who are interested in spending more money. You want to like, serve the Tesla well, Rich customers people. are not easy to serve, I can tell you that. Oh, customers Very are easier to serve. But, 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 saying, but that's not true. The, you know what the average income for our customers? $80,000. They're not rich people. I, rich people do not care necessarily about saving money on a per month basis. People on budgets do. And I would say this, I will serve low, it, bad credit customers because the income doesn't necessarily translate at all into credit. I will tell you that. that might be true I will do that if you give me a credit wrap from the state, just like you have. So that might be true 
for your company, but by and large, most providers of private rooftop solar systems are relying heavily on Wall Street to invest. And the reason why they're investing is because they see um, income streams that come from selling services back to me. And that is, that is for now, that, is, that has financed all this. But well, what do I sell to you? Well, a lot of people are claiming that what they're doing is selling energy back to the grid, and so they're getting a payment for the, for the power that isn't consumed by the homeowner, but that is flowing back onto the grid. You're talking about net metering. I am talking about net metering. Okay, we can, I'll trade net re metering away right now. Okay. Give me deregulation. I believe in the people. If the people don't want to sign up and they, and they stay with you guys, then that's fine. So deregulation but I, you know what, that, you know what net metering is? Net, net metering is a battery. Yeah. It's not, you're not buying retail and selling wholesale and getting cut up. It's a battery. I think you should be paid a fee for that. So, so there's agreement. No. <laughs> I'm, I'm just saying, like, I, I, there's a customer. We're talking a lot about customers, but I feel like we're not talking about all of the customers. And right now, these technologies aren't affordable for everyone. And one of the roles that utilities have historically played is providing access to energy to everyone. And we actually because have an the state obligation gave you, to serve. The state gave you a monopoly right. Yeah. I, and and a credit just, wrap. Give it to me, and we'll, we'll level the playing field. And I jump. I we will serve all customers. Let's let Jim jump in here. Okay. Jim, would let me you like to say jump in. I, There's a couple... I mean, again, so we are the largest competitive retailer of energy and gas in North America. So I have some perspective. And, and on this business, I've, I've run Green Mountain Energy. So I've sold green energy to uh, low income and high income households. I've managed the direct energy business here in Texas, where we were the third largest retailer. But the best retailer is still the third largest. Um, <laughs> I, I guess a couple of things. Like, first of all, you know, I, 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 you, you made the point not many people have switched where there's been deregulation or, or markets. And I hate, I hate the term deregulation. Because just the fact of the matter is, just so everybody knows, before Texas, quote unquote, deregulated, the uh, rule book was pretty thin. And it was pretty thin because they had the utility by their dollars. They didn't have to worry about you know, service and quality because they said, if we don't like you, we'll just cut your rates. So today in Texas, we face more regulation than the utilities ever faced in 1995. Uh, HLNP or TU. So that's the first point. Secondly, everybody does choose, and they have made choices, and they are making choices. Texas is a great example. All six million plus households choose every single day. For those of the people in the room that live here, some of you probably have your spreadsheets at home and debate between direct energy and some other company every six months or every four months. So where you properly establish a market, it works. Where you properly establish a market in the Northeast, 95 plus percent of the industrial and commercial customers in the Northeast United States have gone to choice. Why? Because it's, it's effective. Because they don't want to be served by a monopoly. Again, I think it, you know, this whole conversation, I think, you know, and I don't know, I don't know why, well, I do know why. It's about money, right? And it's about regulatory capture, and it's the ability to continually over um, um, install capital and earn a rate of return on it. Of course, it makes perfect sense. If I were a monopoly utility, and I wish I had picked that path and becoming a competitor many years ago, that was a bad choice by my father. Um, um, <laughs> I, I would do the exact same thing. I, I just think at the end of the day, we have to make a decision, and I would ask the utilities to lead us here and help us. Putting the customers in the driver's seat will make a big benefit for everybody. We're gonna have to have this conversation about the relative value of your wire and how much of a natural monopoly that wire is. I think from your perspective, it's 100% it's wire and you wanna get full compensation. I think other people would say over time that that is not a natural monopoly. Clearly. Producing a kilowatt hour of electricity is no longer a natural monopoly. There is no, there is no, and no one in, in, no one that's been in this business can make that argument at all. So the idea that any utility has a rate base around generation makes no sense today. And there is no natural monopoly for retailing services, be it a solar panel or some other service or battery. That is fundamentally not a natural monopoly. Those two things you should agree and your industry should agree to say, let's just at least let that happen. We can have a conversation later on is transmission and distribution a natural monopoly and how we should compensate the monopoly for providing that battery service. I think that's, I think all those things are fair. Um, you know, I think one thing that you're leaving out of the conversation, particularly when you make the overbuild rate-based case, is that um, we have forgotten that there are state regulators, I know lots of them, and they have a pretty big role in this, and so they are charged, 
And this might be some of the regulatory regime that we need to talk about, you know, whether or not it continues to make sense going forward. But at present, their job is to review our investments and say if they are used and useful, just and reasonable and necessary on behalf of customers. And then they limit what it is we can invest. And our rate of return is dramatically less than either of you, any of you would think was a sufficient return on your investment. Yes, we've been granted a monopoly. And in exchange, we have a regulated rate of return. And it's not the kinds of rates of return that other businesses would accept. You know, it's in the single digits. And people go after them all the time, both at the federal and state level. So just, but just want to make sure that we understand that, like, that narrative that all we do is build without any sort of check on what we do, I think is, is inaccurate. We make investments to continue to make the system affordable and reliable. And as long as people are continuing to use those poles and wires, maybe they won't in the future. Maybe they won't. But as long as they're continuing to use them and your value stream is dependent on the value that I invest in those things, I should be compensated for Absolutely. them. Absolutely. No, I, I totally agree. I mean, I, I, and I, I think as an industry, we're not having that robust conversation. And we're, you know, we're, direct energy is a part of the advanced energy economy, and we are trying to have a conversation with the electric utilities to ensure that there is a fair compensation for the residual assets which are needed for society writ large, which I think for the next 10 to 20 years includes the, the wires and pipes. I, you know, over by 2050 when I no longer have to worry about this stuff. <laughs> Somebody else can have that conversation. But in that time scale, I think the pipes and wires will be here and I think it's absolutely appropriate that we as an industry talk about how to fairly compensate for the risk and the reward that goes into keeping aluminum up or steel in the ground. Um, and can then we also talk about who is going to make sure that all customers are served? If what you Absolutely. want to do is go away from the monopolies, you know, the monopolistic but, approach. But Emily, this. we've done that in yeah. Texas. There is, I mean, we've done that. And, and I mean, that to me is, is, is the same, you know, there's a conversation, and, and I don't want to get too local here, but there's a conversation in, in you know, Envy Energy is running, what I would say is just a, a conversation of fear, uncertainty, and doubt. The oldest marketing ploy in the book is FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt, right? Keep, keep them scared because you don't want them to make a choice. You know, the idea that a market, I mean, you know, I'm right here, this building right now is being energized because ERCOT, there's no one that has an obligation to serve this except the market. And we've done that now for 15 plus years. And the Baker Institute did a wonderful study that I would reference a year and a half ago that talks about how the market is working in Texas. So I'm happy to have that conversation. I think that's, again, it's an element of fear when you say, well, who's going to supply the last person? Everyone in Texas has served, to the, in fact, more efficiently, uh, more effectively than is being served in other parts of the country with the, the full range of choices. So I'm happy to have that conversation, but I'm, let's I'm not gonna, throw that I'm going to say one thing that I'm going to stop talking because okay. I've talked a lot, but I, that wasn't meant to be a fear-mongering okay. comment. It's actually meant to be something that's actually really integral in how utilities, electric companies view themselves. As you talk to people who work at those companies, they say, oh, I have an obligation to serve everyone, and they take it seriously. And when you start, it's not that you can't do it. I mean, ERCOT and the way that Texas is designed is different from the way that we have moved to more customer choice in other jurisdictions. And so, you know, ERCOT in Texas can make total sense. It isn't how everyone else operates in deregulated markets or in restructured markets, I think is maybe the, the nicer way of saying yeah. it, restructured markets. But it is a, something that has to be grappled with as a policy determination. Like, not only I can do it, but if I'm not going to do it, are you going to do it? And right now, I have member companies that have deployed 30,000 plus utility line crews that are gonna get the power back on in Florida and in Alabama and Georgia as we have a hurricane. Okay, so maybe we don't need those poles and wires as much in the future, but we might still need them. Who's gonna be responsible for those elements of reliability? Though that cost is being borne by electric companies because it makes more sense for us to do it and then socialize those costs than to have individual customers pay for that reliability. Those are policy questions we need to discuss. It's not just, yes, let's let customers choose. There are some elements of this that I think are better done in a more centralized way. That's not a bad thing. This is fun, but I want to inject yeah. a little bit different yeah. comment. Yeah. Go for it. <laughs> I, I have a feeling some of these conversations have been had a few times. Um, you know, one of the things about that we are seeing, and I think if we broaden this conversation beyond just the United States, is many of these technologies are actually making their way economically without policy support in many locations. 
And so I don't think it's a question of they only exist because they've got some kind of support mechanism and other things. I've been working in batteries for over a decade. There's been no support mechanism for batteries and energy storage at all. There's no tax breaks. There's no uh, policy mandate. And, and we found ways for companies that are looking for improvements in their cost profile and improvements in their reliability to show that these systems work better than the alternatives that they had. They've moved into marketized systems and ancillary services where that was allowed and they sort of crept in the back door and suddenly became the way to do that. Um, they started, started to make their way when utilities looked at procuring things and, and what we asked was, well, look at all the options and compete them on a, on a level playing ground and all of a sudden storage started to win some of the kinds of contracts that, that other things had. Um, now we're seeing hybridization with solar and storage. We're seeing hybridization with thermal and storage. I think there's a lot of opportunities. And, and if you look beyond even the utility sector into the commercial industrial sector, more and more companies are making choices directly to bring in their own sources of power generation and the ways they manage reliability and manage their consumption. And that, that relates to, in many cases, solar, storage, and other um, you know, distributed technology. So I think this debate has moved beyond the policy. I mean, I, I think policy always has an impact, and we can slow things down or speed things up. Well, we definitely can shift them one way or the other. John and I were talking at dinner last night. Um, you know, there have been times when we've seen the policies that were intended to help support something actually have the opposite effect in that, uh, you know, I, I, just thinking about storage in particular, uh, there were uh, a push in the Recovery Act to uh, see storage move forward. That had the effect of freezing the market for over a year because nobody knew what the subsidy support was going to be. No supplier wanted to cut you a price before they found out exactly how much money you were going to have in your pocket. And so we, we essentially didn't move forward for over a year because of the Recovery Act desire. So there's, there's unintended consequences also. But I think what we're seeing is these things are, are becoming fundamental trends of where we're moving, and it's not just in the United States. It's in many places in the world. I work in a lot of countries where there's no policy mechanism for solar or storage, and we're seeing that become the, the fundamental choice like time and again just based on economics and the need for, for solving some of the core problems that they have. And that's true for electric companies if you look at what it is that we have put on our system. The number one capacity addition in the last three years has been solar followed by gas, followed by wind, and more and more electric companies deploy storage all the time. I think that's entirely accurate. When things make economic sense, people do them. Well, I just want to make sure we don't stay in the world where this only makes sense for rich people, because, because it's making we sense for a lot of people. I think we were mostly having a rooftop people. solar fight. And a, a, but, um, so, so you guys don't. Rooftop solar makes sense for a lot of people that are not rich. It can. That's a fact. That's but, a fact. So are you, you don't support incentives for storage. Well, I'm in the storage business. I'd love incentives for storage. I, I don't know if I can say that, but <laughs> I think I think somebody might argue. I make the email he's worried about getting if I say that. But um, no, I, I think there's economic <laughs> reasons that drive these at a more fundamental level. And, and there are times and there's policy reasons to support things. You know, we live in a world where we're balancing reliability, cost, and uh, stewardship, essentially, right? And, and we're constantly making trade-offs between those three things. We don't have much tolerance for a lack of reliability. Not in something as fundamental as electricity. Power sector has huge economic consequences. We have not a lot of tolerance for cost, but a little bit more tolerance for cost than unreliability. And then the third leg here ends up being stewardship. How much of that do we want to pay for? So. What, what I look at in these technologies is, do they advance those on all three levels? You know, are, are we talking about technology or policies that only advance one of those legs of the stool or advance all of the legs of the stool? We just went through a mechanism in the UK where they uh, have a whole new capacity procurement mechanism. It's marketized. They have very clearly stated goals of managing what they call the trilemma. How do we do reliability, affordability, and environmental management? Um, but they put forward a mechanism which basically caused them to select diesel plants, old diesel plants, as their new forms of capacity because the mechanism favored cost only, even though their stated policy goals are all three of these things. We have to design things a little bit better than that. So uh, that's a balancing factor that I, that I think we have to get at. But I, I think the economics of these are really moving them more fundamentally than policy at this point. Thank you. I'd like to transition the conversation a little bit and take a step back here. 
We've heard the terms reliable and resilient several times, and I think it would be helpful to talk about what does it mean for the electric sector to be reliable and resilient, and why are we hearing so much about those terms now? And Jim, would you like to start us off? Sure. I mean, I, I think just to build on John, I think those, those are, again, the trilemma. So we're a British firm, so I hear that from, from my leadership all the time. Um, sustainability, affordability, and reliability. We have moved from this term of reliability to the question of resilience, and resilience is sort of how quickly one recovers after a fault. Um, um, and I think the whole industry is, is having a relook at what has come out of the 70s and 80s in definition of utility reliability. And again, I, it's driven because customers are no longer um, accepting the reliability levels that they are receiving from the wire. Again, for my purpose at my home, the reliability is perfectly fine. But if you're a, a Bucky's or if you're a, a grocery store with a million dollars of frozen food, you're going to have a different level of, of conversation about what do you need to do. And, and again, it's even interesting inside of that sector, take the grocery. I mean, some grocery may say that they're fine with a four-hour outage and they're fine with that cost risk. Other grocers are saying, no, I'm not fine because I have a unique role in the community and I want to have a, a 24-7 capability that people will always be able to get a bag of ice, they'll always be able to get a bottle of water because I believe that it's important for me and it's a part of my message and my, my uh, uh, service. I think the other thing we've heard in, in resiliency, so, so I, I do say with John, it is, and this is why I'm such a big believer in this element of design, if you allow consumers to make this choice inside of a, a stable policy framework, I think they'll make the choice that's right for them, which in aggregate will be right for our community and our society. The, I mean, no doubt the other big conversation you may have heard in the last, um, I don't know, year and a half is a question of resiliency. Uh, and, it, you know, one can argue, and it's coming out of the, the administration, um, that there may be doubts uh, and, and I think it's, it's an interesting question that natural gas, which has been, as, as Emily mentions, one of the primary uh, fuel sources, new fuel sources have been deployed. Um, for those that are old enough, remember, you know, I wasn't, but remember the Fuel Use Act, we couldn't burn natural gas. There was a moment when we thought there was nothing left. Again, government's hand at work. Um, so, uh, uh, but now we're having a new government question about do we like the uh, generation fleet? Do we like the mix of generation that's coming being distributed or, or um, um, utility scale, solar and wind? Do we like all of the natural gas? Are we worried about that cold day in Buffalo or Erie, Pennsylvania, and can we provide that? Um, I think those are absolutely appropriate questions for policymakers to have because as the transition happens, we have to be open to the idea that maybe the market may have a little bit of dislocation. I, I hope that we don't uh, employ um, uh, or further slow this transformation through some um, heavy-handed approaches that favor one fuel type um, or, or, or better yet, one corporate entity. Um, um, you know, energy policy often is corporate policy, I think, in America, um, which is a mistake, and we should allow the market to operate as much as possible. So, you know, on the big, broad questions of coal and nuke, do we have enough, do we not? I think there's that, that issue has been overplayed. I think it's not uh, appropriate to sort of pick the winner, uh, let the market continue to work. I think the natural gas industry has not done as well as it could do over the last few years in, in demonstrating how reliable it really is and how capable it is. There is a fundamental mismatch between the power industry and the gas industry that uh, we have to figure out how to, to bring uh, the, the players together um, and make sure that both industries are comfortable with ensuring an, uh, an adequate supply of electricity at the right time in the right place. Thank you. John? Uh, you know, resilience to me, I, I touched on a little bit in my opening comments, is about flexibility in a large case. I think we come at resiliency from a, a, a lot of ways, but, you know, we've seen times when the, you know, the coal pile freezes. So maybe it's not the best in the cold sometimes. And we've seen the line slow or gas. So everything has its challenges. I don't think we're finding that there's one sort of super fuel or one super solution to this. It is a bit of a portfolio. And that's, that's the way the system's built today. It's a bit of a portfolio. We look at that resiliency question and say, 
if in the future, when I have all these long-lived assets, I don't have perfect vision into how things are changing and how rapidly they're, they're going to change, I need to build in more ability to handle change that I didn't anticipate and in times that I didn't anticipate. I think some of the things that we're seeing with storage, one of the reasons is driving many projects. Uh, we did a project in California, which was spurred on by challenges that they had around leaks in the gas field. And so suddenly they were concerned about summer capacity. The only thing that could be built in the time frame to deal with that summer capacity was storage. So we had a number of facilities. We built two that were the largest in the world at the time in about six months, from, from contract to go to online testing, about six months. There's no other thermal power plant that could have been built in that time frame. And so you're seeing for resilience and reliability purposes, sometimes the new technologies are saving the old technologies. That's not always true everywhere, um, but we're seeing it again in Australia. Huge problem of, of lower investment in their transmission infrastructure, lots of distributed power coming from lots of sources. They don't have a way to upgrade those lines in the near term. They're adding storage to deal with uh, uh, line reliability issues and cost spike issues. You know, storage can help mitigate. So I think resilience is a lot about are we building in the flexibility to deal with some of the could be low probability circumstances, but they're, they're things that could occur. And are we designing, are we thinking about the power system in total to deal with some of those ahead of time? Thank you. John Berger? Yeah, I, I think uh, Jim hit it spot on, is, is that typically, you know, and the reason why these became buzzwords in the last uh, 18 months or so is, is was driven by politics, and, and specifically for corporate, and specifically for coal and nuke. Um, again, I think whether it's a small, they could be the most brilliant people in the world, Emily, but when they're a public utility commission or any other small group, that is inferior to the market and to the people. And allow the people to choose what they want. And in terms of response and in, in, in going into what fuel sources or what energy sources uh, are resilient or reliable and so forth, you know, I'd point to our experience as a company in Puerto Rico. We were the uh, largest or second largest uh, residential power supplier in Puerto Rico next to PREPA. Now, I'll tell you the difference between in terms of the number of homes served is quite a bit lower. Main reason is PREPA, you know, puts a lot of actions and in, in roadblocks in our way, tremendous amount, including not necessarily following the law every time. Uh, and when we got flattened, our, and I knew this ahead of time as Maria was coming in, I knew our weakest link wasn't those solar systems in the, on the rooftops. It wasn't those inverters on the rooftops or on the side of the house. It was that pole and wire. We had to swing off the system by law, by law, that is a law all the way across the land, and we didn't have batteries yet. That's been a relatively new technology, and indeed, John and I were talking last night, Puerto Rico really transformed the battery industry. The Asian companies, whether they're Chinese, Korean, Japan, Japanese, they weren't even looking at the U.S. residential storage market till Maria hit Puerto Rico. And then we started moving a lot of batteries in, and a lot of things are changing very quickly yet again. In fact, all of our customers since the storm, 100% of them, we are selling batteries with. We will not sell a net metered system because the system itself doesn't make any sense. It also certainly doesn't make sense to rewire the system, particularly in the mountain areas, because the cost is too high relative to distributed solar and batteries. That is a fact. I found it humorous that uh, some Republican senators were arguing with the Department of Energy, not exactly a liberal-leaning group of folks, I would say. They were like, well, wait, no, solar's too expensive, like what Emily said. You must be wrong. No, we're not. The numbers are the numbers. The facts are the facts. By the way, these are the numbers without the investment tax credit. Oops. Guess costs kind of went pretty quickly in terms of coming down for solar and storage much faster than what the government agencies thought they would. And our panels largely did very well. I can't get too explicit about that. I got Baker Bots in the room. They're our law firm. They'll get upset. But they did very well. And it was surprising to, to a lot of folks. As, but the centralized system did not. So I think it's a larger question about what reliability and resiliency is. Clearly, as Jim said over and over again, there's many customers that want different levels of service. And that's my point. 
Stop trying to treat us all the same. We're not the same. I want different level of reliability. I want a different level of cleanness or carbon-free power. I want a different level of, of you know, these, the service that I get from the company. And it, depending upon what I'm willing to pay for and what I need for my life, for my business, I should be able to choose the different levels, not just everybody will be created equal. And indeed, this pressure has been building a long time. 18% of US homes have a backup generator, typically fired on diesel or natural gas. 4% of that 18% has a whole home generator. So people want reliability that they're clearly not getting from a centralized system because the wire in the air is the most unreliable piece of infrastructure. And I would, I would, I would add, here's another market point. My company is not regulated. Unfortunately, we, the more money we spend, the more money it, it, we don't make, okay? Unlike the utility, the more money they spend, the more money they make, literally. That's not hyperbole. That is the way we structured it. And by the way, if any of you can give me that business model, I think Jim and John would sign up for that. Come see me afterwards. We'll take care of you financially for the rest of your life. It's a great model if you can get it. And my company responded in a market-based approach, and this was Jim's point, that it doesn't take a heavily regulated to the point where it's a government agency monopoly to deliver those, those reliability services, to move those crews in those disaster areas. And I, we can prove that because my company did that. Now we have a lot to learn that we can learn from the utilities and I wanna learn that. We're staffing up because we know as we put batteries in here and more and more people maybe defect from the grid because it's too expensive, because it doesn't serve their needs, that our reliability or our demands on our service are gonna go up exponentially and we better be ready for it. So we're spending an awful lot of time, and my point is the market will serve the people as it does in every single industry. Let the market work, let the people vote. Emily? Um, I, I thought Jim hit a lot of really good points on resiliency. I'm, I'm gonna not rise to some of the bait, but I am gonna say that people really like markets when markets produce the outcomes that favor them, and they tend to dislike markets when they stop producing the outcomes that favor them. And I think it's to every business model's peril to assume that the market will always choose you. And I think one of the conversations we had earlier was about um, moving technology and the pace of technology. And you know maybe I don't think fuel cells are five years away, but maybe they are. And then the market is gonna choose that. And so I, I think there is a role for regulation and there is a role for policy because markets don't always produce outcomes that are entirely perfect for everyone. Yet customers should be able to choose, but you know, saying that the only factor that we should consider is what the market would, would come out with when we're talking about an essential public service, sometimes it feels kind of strange to me. And I, and I guess on some level, um, that doesn't mean we need excessive regulation, but I will tell you that my members are regulated on the reliability side, and that's not a business model you would want to opt into um, because it is expensive, it is time-consuming, it requires audits. If you violate a NERC reliability standard, it's a million-dollar a day per violation fine. Like That's an obligation that we've taken on, and, and outside of huge, horrible natural disasters like Category 4 and 5 hurricanes that hit Puerto Rico and hit the U.S. twice this fall and three times last fall, Reliability, actual reliability is 99.97%. So yes, some big industrial customers want, have particular concerns about variance and frequency and they need better services and you could provide that to them with a, a range of technologies. You could help them with storage, you could help them with other distributed resources. There are lots of ways of meeting those needs. Um, but, but Puerto Rico is a, such a strange example because that utility, which is a, a municipal utility, although a state-run utility for all intents and purposes, was bankrupt when that storm hit. And, it, and in fact, the, it was chronically underinvested in, which is really unfortunate for the people of Puerto Rico. But you know, to say all that the poles and wires in Puerto Rico, uh, you know, they all went down, everything went down. It was a chronically underinvested in system. Yes, we should definitely think about how to redo that system to make it more reliable for the people, and that might definitely include more distributed systems because, as you mentioned, it has a huge mountainous backbone, and it might not make sense to have transmission wires cross over that. And I think that's a, a good way of looking at resiliency. What makes sense here? In some places, interconnection provides a huge level of reliability because it allows us to have outages and then to rebalance the system. In some places, the ability to be a part of the grid and then disconnect from the grid might also be a really great way of maintaining resiliency. Um, 
but I don't know how we've dealt with the near-term humanitarian crisis in Puerto Rico other than just put the system back up again. And this is where you could also have a policy conversation because my members sent crews down there to, to put the power system back together again. And under federal law, the only thing they could do was rebuild it the way that it was. Now, it's definitely better because it was all rebuilt, but we had to put together the system that was there because federal law doesn't allow you to basically profit off of disaster. Um, do I think long term we need to have a conversation about how to make Puerto Rico more resilient? Yes, I think island communities deserve that conversation. But to say that Puerto Rico is the poster child for the lack of reliability of the power sector seems a little extreme to me. Um, but I think you're right. Like, there's a conversation about how to value flexibility. I, I don't think we value flexibility, and flexibility could contribute a lot to resiliency. And I think a lot of different resources can contribute to um, resiliency. And I guess that's why one of our mantras, and this will be my last comment, has always been we look at a diverse fuel mix, and we've always supported a diverse fuel portfolio for generating electricity. The actual real answer to the question about what you do about New England is actually cheap hydro from Canada because there's a ton of it, it's cost pennies, and all we need to do is bring it across from Quebec. And that's really how, you don't need to be, you know, we do need more gas in New England, I'm not gonna say that we don't, particularly because that's a home heating fuel, but not for electricity generation as much. We can do a lot um, to decarbonize New England. In fact, they are leaders in decarbonization, um, despite the fact that they have really cold winters, but the way that they do that is through a diverse mix of resources. Can I, you know, one of the other things, going back to your question, and, and trying to build on Emily's um, point. Uh, energy is, um, and so I, I'm, I'm a believer in markets, but I also know markets fail. Um, um, there's, there's a balance there, and, and energy specifically. I, the term I use is that energy is not just a commodity, it's a political commodity. Um, within a normal operating band, government will let us do most anything we want, but once we cross that band, they quickly step in. And so I don't have an answer here, but in terms of the trends and in, in where we're going, that nature of being a politi political commodity, specifically around power, which is probably the most political commodity, is electricity, is, is, is sort of under, um, is challenged with the discontinuity in our political cycle of this uh, extreme populism that we're seeing more and more places. And I, I don't have an answer to that problem. I think we are all gonna face that over the next 20 years is dealing with governments which are not trusted, um, governments which are doubted, um, um, governments which are swinging uh, further uh, um, often to extremes and not finding balance and then this nature of so many critical problems to solve on affordability, sustainability, and reliability. And I, and I, don't, I don't have an answer, but it, it, against the trend of design and digitization and distributed and decarbonized, I think we have to always remember that in the backdrop, uh, I think the industry has to find a way to help uh, our political leaders um, um, find a path forward that works in any environment, in any political environment. Well, this has been an excellent conversation, and I hate to cut it off, but I do want to open the floor to some questions before we wrap up before the coffee break. Hi. Not that my conclusion is important, but I, I will state an observation that I've seen from all of you. It, it seems that sometime in the future, the regulated utilities will have to be taken over by a government, the federal government. Um, and I, I, my question is, uh, when do you think that that will happen, or why do you think it won't happen? I think we're going to be taken over by Amazon. I don't think it's a, no, I'm 100% I'm serious. Um, because they're all correct in that the future of electricity is about what customers want. And a lot of what we do is, um, you know, Electric companies in the 70s, 80s, our job was to be big asset managers. We're actually super good at that, um, despite comments about the fact that all we do is invest to earn a rate of return. We're good asset managers. We have great engineers. We can engineer the heck out of the system. Um, but customers want stuff. And you know who provides customers with stuff right now? Amazon. Have you seen Amazon Home Services? If you want to go buy a brand new Audi electric car, the Audi webpage pushes you to Amazon Home Services to buy your charger. Uh, I mean, just 
I, I don't know when the plat two different questions though. There's an infrastructure component and a platform question around how we do that. I mean, if I think about the, the iPhone, there's there's about 20 billion people that have this. I don't know some huge number, but no one iPhone is the same, right? Because we all have different apps on our phone. The the big question we have to say. I don't think we'll nationalize the infrastructure. We will change the economic model of the infrastructure. The bigger question that we have to figure out is how do we build a platform that lays the operating system above the hardware to allow for all these apps to plug and play into it. It's a longer conversation. I think that's the real question that the government needs to help us resolve. Do we just fall back to the model we have today where the infrastructure player runs the operating system? Or do we allow some other third party to step in? Or do we allow it to be completely decentralized and try to deploy some kind of blockchain solution? I mean, that's a, that's a much longer conversation. Uh, can we have one more question from over here and then we'll take one another Okay, side. so um, uh, I wanted to sort of ask questions related to a lot of the debates you're having uh, about um, you know, the, the role of markets and uh, so on. Um, uh, the, here, I think the big issue is that um, a lot of the costs in the electrical system, as, as Emily was saying, are, are fixed costs. Uh, and the problem is that um, the way we charge for electricity right now, we bundle those fixed costs into a variable charge. And so the problem is that uh, you take, take someone who has solar panels on their roof, once they start taking electricity for fewer hours, they're not contributing uh, as much to paying all those fixed costs because you know they only pay for the fixed costs while they're actually drawing from the system. Uh, and so, in a sense, you know they, they are getting subsidised. It's not just net metering when they sell power back; it's even when they just avoid buying it, they're not really covering uh, those fixed fixed costs. And I think this is uh, the point that Emily was getting at. You said it much better, though. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so that, that's the problem because because the prices aren't really reflecting the structure of costs you're not getting the right, consumers are not getting the right signal, and so then they can actually make a mistake. And so what's in their interest is not necessarily in the um, interest of the system as a whole. And this also relates back to regulation. Where's regulation? It's regulation that's determining the structure of prices, right? So here's my question. Uh, what do all the panelists say uh, about we should restructure the pricing for electricity? So there's a fixed charge, that reflects the fixed costs and a variable charge that reflects the variable costs, and then people will make the right uh, decision. Some people will decide they're better off disconnecting from the system entirely, getting the battery, getting the panels and so on, and that's fine, they're making the right decision. The problem at the moment is because we're, we're bundling those fixed charges into a variable charge, people are getting the wrong signal and they can make the wrong decision. So how about we, we switch our structure of prices for, to a fixed charge for being connected to the system plus a variable charge for the, uh, for the energy. I, I'm gonna I think let these, are, these are good points, I, and I would say this is a little bit of what I was trying to touch on earlier with saying a lot of our charges are, are, are fixed in the bill, and we, we tend to focus on this, what's the per kilowatt hour, but that's in many of the U.S. anyways, those charges are broken out separately, and that's one of the things that is driving people to put in storage, do other things. They're putting in storage to manage demand charges, which are set on a couple peak times of usage over the course of the year. We find a lot of customers can add storage, avoid those few times of overutilization, over and dramatically reduce the cost to the system. Now, the challenge is it doesn't actually reduce the cost of the system. It just reduces the cost of the customer's bill. And so you have this problem that those costs still have to be borne somewhere in the whole system, right? I think this, well, the way we look at this is it's a utilization problem, right? So we're building infrastructure and every incremental amount of infrastructure that we build is used marginally less than the last piece of infrastructure that we build and it costs us something. I think what we have to focus on is for every piece of social infrastructure that we invest in, however we intend to pay for it, how do we maximize the utilization? If you look at power plants, if you look at transmission distribution networks, they're used a very low percentage overall. You know, peak utilization on transmission distribution networks is about 50% because we hold part back for reliability. That's an enormous overhead and we do it for a purpose. We do it for reliability. But there are technologies emerging today that will allow us to raise network utilization and still maintain reliability. And I think that's where we have to go as a society, whether it's an island or a larger grid. It doesn't matter. It's about how do we utilize to the fullest the expensive capital assets that we're buying. And storage is one part of that. There's a lot of other things that are contributing to it. 
what I would also say is, is that this is my point about where uh, the market needs to step in. And unfortunately, I, you know, that, that is directionally, I think, correct in terms of doing a fixed charge would be something that we need to move towards instead of a variable charge. Now, there, there are many utilities, some of Emily's members, that have done so a little bit. There are problems with this, major problems. One is it's an extremely regressive tax. Talk about get, uh, you know, going against the, the low income. That would be a great, you know, the way to do it. And that's why a lot of people, uh, particularly the politicians, don't want to do that. Second, it's very destructive as far as environmental. It's like going to all you can eat bar. And so that, that, those are issues there. But what I would also say is the bigger problem is the misallocation of capital. And so when you have a command and control economy and entities that go out there in however way they get it through the process and basically just put the capital, we know best, we'll tell you what to do. What it, what it does is it creates what they like to call later when they make a mistake and it's obvious to everybody, it's called stranded cost. And now I want all of you to get your wallets out and leave some money up here on the table for Emily before you leave because that's exactly what they want. They want grid defection charges. So imagine this, I cut AT&T uh, earlier this year because my kids wanted to do YouTube and Netflix and so forth, and it was cheaper. Did I get a bill for $25,000 for leaving the system? No. Did you, how many people here have a landline still? Not many. Did you get a bill from AT&T for $25,000 because you left the system? You didn't like their landline service anymore? We had planned to you to be there for 30, 50 years because that's what people said. It was going to take so long for the cell phone to really get there. So you owe us. Oh, you didn't see that contract? It was implied. I'm sorry. You have to pay us. That's where this problem gets into is that we need to come together. We need to figure out exactly what the wire is worth. And by the way, if you put a wire charge in there of $100, $200 like some of Emily's members want to do, that buys a lot of batteries today and control electronics today, let alone in three years and five years. That's not a solution. It's not a panacea. We must come in, start to slow the spending down, figure out how to cut costs. A lot of these assets, I was, it was funny, I'm not going to name the utility, not, I know it's a member, Emily, but this, this gentleman that runs all their transmission, it's a very large utility in the eastern part of the United States. That's the only hint I'll get. He was very proud that some of those lines have been there since 1900. Okay, how many times have the ratepayers paid for those lines? They've only paid for them once. Once they were depreciated, they were no longer. There's all tricks in rate to the base. trade to be doing depreciation, is my point. There's also can you more efficiently manage that on a market base? Can some of the utilities that would truly be companies, not unlike the midstream oil and gas industry, go in there and find ways to cut cost. If it wasn't that every time they spent money, they got that money back plus then some. I would think that all of us can agree that a market-based approach, when you have people who are incented to cut costs, that the costs and dollars, billions of dollars would fall at the end of this system. So much to unpack there. Um, I don't know that I can Give it remember. A try. I don't know if I can remember it all. So one, I, I already interjected and I said, you know, once a piece of physical equipment is depreciated, and it's true, it can be 20, 30, or 40 years, and sometimes it's only five or 10, depending on the size of the thing and the investment, it is no longer included in rate base and customers no longer pay for it. So they are definitely not paying for a pole that was built in 1900. I find it interesting that on the one hand, um, we are accused of over-investing, and at the other hand, we're accused of running things that's really old, which is it? Um, you know, I think that there are real conversations that could be had about planning with utility commissions about investments. But I have to tell you that those conversations already go on. Do we need to incorporate other technologies into those conversations, into the planning conversation? Sure. That's not, that's not a difficult thing to do, and I think everyone is willing to come to the table and say what investments make sense. In fact, the advanced energy economy and I have had conversations about how instead of pushing utilities to make investments in things like, for example, cloud computing, which we are not experts on, and which would potentially go into rate base, 
let's actually make investments in O&M, which we don't earn a rate of return on, but let's find a teeny rate of return so that we can then invest in having like other people provide those services to us and so that we can be encouraged to do the less expensive thing. There are ways of making this work. It's not just all about, you know, not every single dime a utility spends is not put into rate base, and that's kind of a, a little bit of a misnomer the way that he's done this, but um, gosh, I kind of remember all the other things. On fixed charges, not all, he, the implication was that all fixed charges are like $1,000 or $100 a month. That's not accurate. They reflect the cost of the systems, and many of the fixed charges that my members have are very low. The other comment about if you take away the volumetric price signal that all customers will use you know, unlimited amounts of electricity and that'll be terrible for the environment, the all-you-can-eat salad bar thing. You know, that doesn't square with all of the demand response and energy efficiency that we've seen. Um, a lot of environmental groups and others, energy efficiency advocates, are terrified of moving to a fixed charge and moving away from putting everything into the volumetric rate because they're afraid that it will no longer send a conservation signal to customers. Why not move the, con the conservation signal to companies like ours? Because we're actually better able to manage conservation and make decisions to reduce um, energy usage by helping our customers employ more efficient technologies. It does not mean that there's only going to be a massive increase in electricity, and as you mentioned, consumption is like historically down, and it's not projected to go up. Yeah, I mean, I agree generally that the infrastructure piece, the delivery component, we need to have a new construct. The one other thing I'll say about markets, we've been talking about this now, the utility of the future. I wish we would say the customer of the future, because that's if we start with the customer, we'll probably get it right. We do need to have that conversation, and we need to change the way we look at that infrastructure, the way we look at cost recovery. It has to be fair to Emily, to, to EEI, to the utilities. It has to be fair. I don't make any money. <laughs> but the one thing that I know is that the uncertainty is creating mistakes in choice right now. The lack of knowing, should I put a battery in because I'm gonna have a big fixed charge for distribution or if it's gonna remain volumetric and can I make choices? We are sending the wrong signal to consumers today and so we have to get it right. There, John brings excellent questions. There's issues of affordability and let's not forget the great thing about the way rate making works. Markets hate subsidies and they hate crest subsidies. You cannot I can't charge a customer, you know, uh, one customer for other people's costs because that customer will leave me in a market. Uh, in a regulated environment, I can do that. And that's one of the great reasons we can't move ahead is because there are subsidies embedded in the system and nobody wants to sort of address the elephant in the room. So unfortunately, while this conversation I feel like could continue and continue to be productive and entertaining. We do have to end it here and take our coffee break. I hope you'll join me in thanking our panelists for taking the time to join us today.